Well, good afternoon. Uh, it's a pleasure to have this opportunity to introduce our keynote presenter, Professor Eleanor Ostrom. She is a 2009 Nobel laureate in economic sciences from Indiana University, where she is a distinguished professor, uh, the Arthur F. Bentley Professor of Political Science, Senior Research Director of the Workshop in Political Theory and Policy Analysis, and uh, Center for, she's at the Center for Study of Institutional Diversity at Arizona State. Probably everyone here knows Professor Ostrom far better than I do. I uh, took a little time to review press announcements about important events in uh, Professor Ostrom's life. And the most interesting one, frankly, comes from Indiana University on the occasion of commencement uh, in 2010. And uh, the leaders of Indiana University had good wisdom in inviting uh, Professor Ostrom to be the commencement speaker, uh, the first woman to receive the Nobel Prize in economics. And I think they have justifiable pride in one of the world's most outstanding uh, leaders in this area. Uh, in reviewing her background, you'll find she has all of her degrees from the University of California at Los Angeles, um, beginning in a uh, bachelor's degree in 1954 and then proceeding to earn the PhD in 1965 and, and join the faculty at Indiana University. It's really rewarding to see an individual move from California and come to the Midwest, really succeed to the very highest level and remain with an institution for such a long period of time. Um, I aspire to similar uh, levels of achievement for our faculty, and uh, you're a great role model for many. Uh, I happen to know the president of Indiana University, Professor Michael McRobbie. Uh, he's a very talented person from Australia, recently uh, received his U.S. citizenship with a high level of visibility. And uh, in speaking about Professor Ostrom, uh, he said, She's been a prolific scholar and generous colleague through more than four decades at Indiana University. And this is what I found really interesting. She has also been a dedicated teacher and mentor, sharing or serving on dissertation and advisory committees for more than 130 PhD students and taking a continued interest in their careers and scholarship. Clearly uh, a key contributor to the advance of the field uh, through the tremendous uh, support for uh, a large number of doctoral candidates uh, at Indiana University. Um, she has been uh, a person obviously revered at Indiana University and well before recognition with the Nobel Prize. Uh, the provost uh, at the institution, Karen Hansen, said, She's well known for her close relationships with graduate students and her generous and unwavering support of their research. And uh, this reflects extraordinarily well uh, on a faculty member to be recognized as an individual who really cares about the students they're mentoring and interacts with them very effectively. Chair of the Department of Political Science, Russell Hansen says, Lynn Ostrom is the world's leading expert cooperative management of common pool resources. We at Indiana University also know her as an extraordinary mentor of postdoctoral fellows. Indeed, the workshop in political theory and policy analysis, uh, which she and her husband founded in 1973-74, uh, is really a prime example of how to share the collective wisdom of the generation of scholars with which they engage. She has clearly been uh, a person who's changed the lives of many people and uh, in my estimation has done what we, we would like of every faculty member. She's changed the way people think in a positive way about a very significant area of work. Uh, she served in, in public service capacities as president of the Public Choice Society from 1982 through 1984. She was president of the American Political Science Association from 96 to 97, 
and uh, she was the first woman to chair the Indiana University Department of Political Science. I'm not sure that's political uh, public service, but it's great community service, and those who have served as department chairs know what an important and compelling responsibility that is. Uh, she's obviously a prolific contributor to original literature, including several important books and articles that have run uh, a wide range through her career. Uh, after four decades, she continues to be one of Indiana University's most outstanding researchers and contributors to the life of an institution of increasing value to our country and the world. Please join me in welcoming Professor Eleanor Osterman. We don't have time. I could just talk about my debt to Doug for the next uh, uh, 45 minutes, <laughs> not, not anything else. I think uh, one of the important things that Doug has done, among all, is the development of trying to stress that we need good theory as well as good empirical. Uh, he's done an immense amount of empirical work, but then it, it has been, okay, now how do we understand these processes in a way that we can learn. Uh, I, we've talked to several of us about clear definitions of institutions, uh, the team sport and uh, or teams as organizations is a, a very good one that we used. He's provided evidence about how individuals or groups of individuals, not just governments, crafted important rules. Uh, so you go back into the evolution of uh, long distance trade. And that was not all government to government. Uh, you had the equivalent of a notary public and a variety of other individuals uh, who were very, very instrumental. Uh, he's trained uh, generations of us uh, to appreciate the importance and the diversity. So you don't get from Doug's work, this is the best one. Here's an array, here's how they came about, here's some of the consequences. So I owe him a personal debt, which I'm going to talk about later. Um, but I'm going to now turn to um, institutions. So you're doing institutional analysis now on a particular topic. You won't be surprised that it's resource governance that I'm going to be talking about. Um, I'm very, very concerned about current policy prescriptions. Um, the, um, uh, we have um, this presumption that individuals are trapped, they're dumb. Now when they're in the market, they're smart. <laughs> but the same as individuals who might not be in a market setting now are dumb and trapped. Um, and the presumption uh, growing in the uh, tragedy of the commons uh, and uh, the uh, problems of collective action theory um, has been presented as the truth. And so students in undergraduate programs are preached at with that kind of, of evidence. Uh, and then after you show that people are helpless and dumb and stupid and all the rest, then you have you come to the thing, well, then how do we get out of the problem? Well, you turn to external authorities who are brilliant. Um, and they can impose ideal solutions from the outside. Um, that's not consistent with Norse work, uh, but it has been kind of consistent with game theory. And so sometimes the legitimacy of this has been uh, drawing on game theory. I happen to use game theory. I don't think that game theory is the foundation, but a narrow view of it has been. Um, so, uh, the game theory models of the prisoner's dilemma um, and other social dilemmas when people were not allowed to communicate, did not know one another, totally anonymous. Um, that did predict, no, and, and I found that to be true. So people said, I've disproved it. No. 
um, uh, in our lab work when people can't communicate and don't know one another and are in a, a dilemma, they, they don't part. <laughs> but the, um, the presumption is that that goes across every way they might relate. Um, and that uh, then what we've had is we've had instances of the sardines being overfished uh, on the west coast, uh, the uh, cod fishery on the east coast, you know, and then the press says, aha, yes, yes, it's, we've got these tragedies coming. They are big problems, no question. We need to take them seriously. But we are taking them seriously and then saying, therefore, the government needs to solve it. Um, so that's why I'm against panaceas, because the presumption comes in, and some of our literature says, look at this mathematical model, uh, all we need to do is to pass this kind of, of special law, and then we'll move people from here to here, and that's optimal. Um, well, those are very general. I mean, we could just talk about a mathematical way of moving them from here to here, but what does that mean in reality? And um, we've had all sorts of emphasis, for example, on government protected areas. We've cre cre created them around the world. Some work, but some have just kicked out people who manage those resources for a very long period of time, and uh, there's considerable problem of overharvesting, et cetera. So I'm gonna give you a little bit of history. Um, there were many, many studies uh, that had been written about uh, settings where pastoralists, inshore fishers, farmers, uh, irrigators had solved these problems. So there, there existed a huge literature, um, but it was written by sociologists, economic historians, engineers, political scientists, anthropologists, you, you know, discipline after discipline. Um, people focused on fisheries, but not water or fit forests. And they focused on one continent. So people were not, you had three big divisions where people were not crossing discipline, resource, continent. This led to a huge um, uh, problem of um, lack of cum accumulation. Uh, there was a National Research Council committee started in the 1980s uh, to assess knowledge. What do we know? and everyone was flabbergasted as we kept identifying more and more case studies. Fenton Martin was a librarian working with us at that point, and within a year she had a thousand case studies identified all over the world, and that just was not known. 